Would you be seated, please? Well, let me introduce myself. I'm Brad. I'm one of the pastors here at Copper Hills, and I uh, want to wish you a uh, Merry Christmas. It's my uh, task, my joyful task, to uh, remind you of the story that has us all gathered here tonight. And just in case you're wondering, it hasn't changed since last year. Same story. Same shepherds, same uh, angels, same wise men apparently from the east, same young teenage mom, like amazing. Um, and, and of course, a kind of a perplexed, dazed fiance, and of course, a baby in a manger, right? That's the story. Uh, it, it means a little more to me, maybe in a different way today, I'll f you and my wife, and I uh, spent uh, 10 days or so in Israel, just got back uh, a week or so ago. And uh, it's quite something to visit the sites that either tradition, like suspect, in and around a particular area, that's where something of Jesus' life happened, or to know for sure that's where something happened, and to think of it happening 2,000 years ago. I mean, how long is 2,000 years? How do, you, how do you bend your mind around that timeline, right? And then uh, what do you do when you, what do you think when you put your foot on a piece of marble where Jesus put his foot? It's like, it's, it's just really surreal to experience that. And then to think about Christmas and just how surreal it is. In so many ways, it's outside of our scope of understanding. Uh, fortunately for us, we have four stories that are the first four books of the New Testament written by eyewitness accounts to Jesus' life. Uh, there's Matthew, there's Mark, Luke, and John. And uh, actually, only three of them tell the Christmas story. Mark leaves it out for some reason. Uh, not that I, I think it was, not that it was unimportant to him, but there were other things that he talked about. Matthew and Luke, on the other hand, give us all the details that you and I have that we celebrate. They actually tell the, the, the facts of the story and what happened, and we enjoy that story a great deal. Luke, by the way, if you're interested, he wasn't an, actually an eyewitness. He was like a research doctor, and he researches the whole thing and comes up with stories that he heard from people, and then he re relates them to us. That leaves John. And John tells the Christmas story in such a unique way. There are no shepherds. There are no angels. There is no young mom. and a dead. None of that's included. Because John has something else he wants us to know. He's interested in the why behind the story. So rather than the details of the story, he leaves it up to his buddies to do that. He comes along and he says, I want to tell you why this is important. Why it matters. Why it's significant. So I want to read a bit of his account for you. And uh, it's taken from early on, the first 10 verses or so into his account. And this is how he writes. He's going to say something two times. Here's the first time that he says it. Jesus came into the world, the very world he created, but the world didn't recognize him. Apparently, there's a sense that Jesus has arrived, but he's not recognized. And it kind of makes sense when you think about the story itself. He came to his own people, and even they rejected him. Now, these are people who were expecting a Messiah to arrive, but when he arrived, they couldn't quite grasp it, didn't quite make sense to them, and so they rejected him. But all who believed in him accepted him and accepted him. He gave the right to become children of God. Kind of confusing words there, maybe. What he's not saying is uh, they, they weren't, um, uh, they didn't, get reborn in the sense that they went back into their mother's womb. That's a little weird. He goes on to say, they are reborn not with physical birth resulting from a human passion or plan, but from birth that comes from God. He wants us to know that there's a change of status that happened. Before this, they didn't have a spiritual life in them. Now they do because they've accepted and received what Jesus offered, as bizarre as the story might be. And then he finishes it with saying what he said at the start of it. So God became human and made his home among us. He was full of unfailing failing love and faithfulness. In other words, as hard as it might be to believe, God, the universe maker, compressed himself somehow or other into a human embryo that became a fetus, that became a baby, that became a boy, that became a man. How do you do that? What's the science behind that? How is that possible? It's inexplainable apart from you settle on it must be a God thing. Must be what he has done. 
And this is the difference that God would make in this story. Does anyone find that a bit preposterous? A little hard to believe. A little hard to bend your mind around. Well, let me try to help with that a little bit. Explain it this way. I'm going to go like sidebar here for just a second. How many of you enjoy murder mystery stories? Like you, you watch CSI and uh, Law and Order. Yeah, like a few of you, like a lot of you do. I know you do because it's kind of a, it's kind of a, a, a craze of watching these. And there's many others. You might go back a generation or two and you might go, well, I really like floral shirts and short shorts. And Magnum P.I. is your guy. Right? Yeah. Yeah, that's right. If you go even further back than that, Dick Tracy, Sherlock Holmes. Uh-huh. My uh, favorite is uh, Frank Drebin, Naked Gun. Yeah, sure. No, he's good. Uh, now, what, what did you do if you had an interest and a passion for murder mysteries, detective stories, but it's prior to the golden age of television and movies and you can't actually watch the story. Way back, I know this is like new information for many of us, way back there were books. <laughs> yeah, like fiction books, detective books. And in the 1910, 20, 30s in there, they were really, really popular because they told these fantastic tales of detective stories and murders being solved and that kind of thing. And one of the most popular writers was an English woman named Dorothy Sayers. Some of you are up on her material, possibly. You remember it from when you read it in the 1920s and 30s. Uh, in, in any event, she was this murder mystery detective writer. Now, she was an interesting woman in her own right. Uh, she, was, she was the very first woman to go to Oxford University in, in England. In fact, trivi, trivia, but she was the first woman to graduate from Oxford and she received her graduation two years after she completed the coursework. Because unfortunately for her, she was going to Oxford in an era where only men could get degrees. And she worked diligently to change that thinking. And two years after she technically graduated, she got her degree. Remarkable woman. Uh, Career-wise, she was a teacher. And she loved to teach. But early on in her teaching career, she discovered she had a passion for fiction, writing fiction. And her genre was detective novels. And uh, as she began to write, she became more and more popular. And that became her profession. That's what she did. Well, the series of detective novels that she wrote introduced us to a character named Lord Peter Whimsey. Uh, who was he? Well, he was uh, uh, the fictional character, the hero of her books, uh, a detective. He was an aristocrat. He was a single man, uh, a fine detective, and well known for his ability to solve impossible murders and crimes. But he had a fatal flaw. He was a troubled man. He would get into all kinds of personal trouble and he would make missteps and character banana peels with regular things he would slip up on. And his life was kind of a wreck. And yet he was this well-known fictional detective. Well, uh, there's like 11 books altogether in the series, something like that. In the eighth book, a new character is written into the story. Dorothy Sayers adds someone to the story who hadn't been in the story before. And her name is Harriet Vane. Now, by coincidence, by interest, whatever it would be, Harriet Vane is uh, an Oxford graduate. Interesting, right? She also is a crime-writing detective novelist in the story. Hmm. She enters the story at a critical time where there's a difficult murder that's, uh, to solve that's happened, and... Uh, Lord Peter Whimsey is working on it. She enters it and she's a key person in that story to solve that particular murder. Well, as a good story will have, Lord Peter Whimsey takes an interest in her. Kind of eyebrows raised and he thinks, oh, she's interesting. She, on the other hand, is not so interested in him because of his character, because he'd be trouble to get connected with. But look what happens. She kind of falls in love with him and he with her. And it's this wonderful romance story where they date for a while and they get engaged and then in the last book of the series they get married and have this wonderful honeymoon and marital bliss that goes on. And really it could be said that her involvement in the story saves his life 
because he's headed to a really bad place overall and she steps in and not only helps him with murders, she actually helps him with his own personal life and could say she saved him and rescued him from that experience. So who exactly is Harriet Vane? Well, many people who have looked at Dorothy Sayers' work, and she's kind of hinted at herself, is Harriet Vane is really Dorothy Sayers. And she writes herself into the story to hear her tell it. She said, I wrote these stories of this fictional person, and I kind of fell in love with him. He developed a real interest in my heart, and I thought, well, maybe the way that I can help him is to create a character that will actually save him. But really, I was writing myself into the story because I had created this character, and then I fell in love with the character, and I wanted good for the character, and I wanted to rescue the character. Isn't that interesting? It's quite moving, actually. I can see some of you are like, tearing up with this one, right? Here's the deal. God actually did that. He actually wrote himself into our story. That's what Christmas is about. God looks at us in trouble. He sees how we have been created by a good God and a loving God, made beautifully and wonderfully, and how we have looked at God and said, we're not maybe as interested in you as you are in us. And we've kind of made our own way. And we've slipped up on some character stuff and we've wandered from him and we've done things and been, become things and made decisions that have really damaged our relationship. And we have this great mystery in our life that we can't seem to solve on our own. Mystery is partly how is it that we could possibly not recognize that God's written himself into our story and we could ignore him or abandon him or walk away from him. And then here's the greater mystery. The mystery is how do we reconnect with the God? Because we know this, that when we damage a relationship, it really damages the relationship. It really does. And the mystery is, how is it possible that once the, once the relationship is damaged, that it could be put back together in some way? And it is for this reason that God writes himself into the human story. And it happens in the most interesting way. It happens in Bethlehem. And it's what we celebrate. God coming into the world to be part of our story. So the question could be then, how is it that we could not recognize that? How is it that God could do that and enter into the human condition, write himself into the story, and we would not see him, notice him, understand, recognize him? Well, you know, that isn't an ancient problem. It is that, but it's a current problem, difficulty for us as well. You see, sometimes uh, God writes himself into the story of our lives, and we don't much like the story that he writes. And we expect him to come in a different way. We expect him to do something different. And when he does what he's going to do, and it's not what we want him to do, we're disappointed with him. And then we try to walk away and do our own thing. That's common for us. Sometimes we've tried God, and it just didn't work out again, maybe the way we wanted. And we go, I'm never trying that again. That was hurtful. That was painful. I'm not, I'm not going down that road again. Sometimes we hedge our bets. We think, well, I think maybe God is true. I think maybe the whole Bethlehem and the cross and all that is true. But what if it's not? What if there's a different offer, a better offer? What if I hold out and see what happens and we just kind of see how life unfolds? Why would we do that? Well, when I was uh, in my late teens, um, I began hanging out with a group of people. There were 20 or 25 of us, something like that. And we just kind of, almost by accident, got together and formed a group of friends. And we would hang out together. We would hike together, mountain climb, party, go to dinner, those kinds of things together. And we developed quite a wonderful friendship together. It was really, really cool. And uh, being 18 years of, old, of age, I got my eye out for, well, uh, uh, potential girlfriends, right? Normal, red-blooded male, somewhat normal. Some debate, maybe. Um, and uh, one, one evening that we're together, I spot her. I see her. And she's so interesting to me. She's beautiful. And she's got this gregarious personality. And she's fun-loving. And like, she's the life of the party. She's everything I'm not. I'm an introvert. I'm shy. I don't actually like talking to people. And she's all over the place. And she's the life of the whole party. I go, I want to get to know her. I'm like, oh, I'm interested in her. And so I, you know, give it my best move, right? And uh, 
I don't quite get the response I'm wanting, but I'm still hopeful. I'm sure that if I try hard enough and stick at this long enough, she's going to eventually see, well, who wouldn't, like, who wouldn't be attracted to this, right? <laughs> Can I tell you who? Just about everybody. You know why? Because I lacked absolute confidence in myself. And one of the reasons I lacked so much confidence in myself is because... Uh, for some reason, God chose to not give me great vision. And uh, since I was five years old, I've worn glasses. Thank goodness for contacts, right? Uh, but by the time I was in my teens and so on, my glasses looked more like, my, like uh, magnifying glasses or the bottom of Coke bottles than they looked like anything else. And I was humiliated with it. I got laughed at at school. I had a pal at school, every time he would walk by me, he would lick his two fingers and run them over top of my lenses. <laughs> yeah, so I was, I was so self-conscious of this. And so when I was interested in this girl, I was sure she wouldn't be interested in me. But I was sure interested in her. And so I thought, well, I'll do my best. Not much chance, probably, but I'll do my best. Well, one of the events that we did together is uh, somebody came up with this idea that we should go to the local community pool and have a swimming evening together. Kind of sounds all right at first, right? I was terrified. Now, I'm not afraid of water at all. I'm not afraid of adventure. I'd just as soon dive out of an aircraft or bungee jump or anything like that. I'm cool with that. That's not it. You know what I was so terrified about? is I would have to go swimming with my glasses or without them. Now, there's only two options for me. One is to go into the pool with my glasses on, and who does that except a dork? <laughs> right here. And I'm already feeling that. I'm not doing that one. Second option is to take the glasses off and go swimming without them, not be able to see past six inches in front of my face, end up, no doubt, swimming next to intimately with a 300-pound wrestler from school, right? Because I can't see who I'm swimming next to. So I am not having either one of those, and I come up with this brilliant idea. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the pool side when everybody else is in the pool. I'm going to look for this girl, and when I spot her, I'm going to make sure she catches my eye, take my glasses off, dive in and swim to where she is. The great plan. This should work, right? So I do that. I spot her, dive in, and she's not there. <laughs> I get to that area and of course I can't see anybody. I can't spot her. I don't know where she is. So I go, oh, go. what a misfire that is. Swim back to the edge of the pool, get out dry off, put the glasses back on. I said, oh, she had moved. <laughs> no wonder. Spot her over here. We wave at each other. I put the glasses down, dive back in, swim to where she is, and she isn't. She's not there. I go, oh, wow, what are the chances I would mess that up twice? But it could happen. Swim back over to the side, dry off, put my glasses back on, spot her the third time. This time, we're looking at each other and we'd like clearly have seen each other, right? Put the glasses back down, dive in and swim to where she is and she isn't. She's not there again. And I catch on. I go, oh, I get what this is. No wonder. She saw me in the glasses and with the swimsuits, swimsuit, that's not a pretty sight. Now, even if I didn't have the glasses, it's not a pretty sight, okay? And she wants nothing to do with me. But she doesn't want to tell me that. Because who would want something to do with me, right? And so, I swim over to the edge of the pool, dry off, put my glasses on, and dejectedly go off to the shower, have a shower, I'm done for the night. Uh, now, unfortunately, we're traveling in the same car together, and so we have to travel together. Me, I'm curled up against the door, <laughs> not wanting to talk. Her, apparently oblivious to this whole thing. She has no idea this has gone down, apparently. Every indication is that she's not seeing what I saw and what I experienced. I married her 39 years ago. No. Mm -mm. You know why I married her? Because in spite of her swimming away from me, now I got to honor her in this. She didn't swim away from me. It's just what happened in the course of that evening. It wasn't what I thought it was at all. Not at all. 
but I thought it was that. So in spite of her swimming away from me, she had so already captured my interest. She captured my heart. I, I think I already loved her. I was so enamored with her beauty and her character and who she was, and I just wanted to be with her. You could use Dorothy Sayers' words, I wanted to write myself into her story. In spite of what she had, I thought, done, I was to pursue her. I wanted to love her. I wanted to convince her that I cared for her, that I was interested in her. I thought she was fantastic. And it took some time. But eventually, we got to the place where we've been for 39 years writing our story together. And it's for us, it's a beautiful, wonderful thing. Why do I tell you all that? Because that's the heart of our God for us. He so longs to write himself into our story that we'll do life with him. That he looks at the world as it is 2,000 years ago and he says, I can't take it anymore. I am going to do something to begin to write myself into their lives, into their world. And you know what? I'm going to come as a baby. I know it's vulnerable. I know it's weak. It's probably not the best idea. But shoot, it's going to work. And so this is what he does and this is what Christmas is all about. That he lovingly, faithfully wants to write himself into our story. Has he written himself into your story? I know he wants to. You know, I would say this evening, if you've never ever invited him to come alongside and write his story with you, would you think about, would you consider doing that? Would you think about what that looks like to join him and let him lead your life? I would say if you've tried that at one time and you just don't think it's turned out well and you're actually disappointed with him, would you give him another try? Give him another shot and see what he'll do. See whether he won't write himself in ways. It could be that you've given up too soon and you've closed the book and it's only half over. And if you were to open it up to him, he would write the rest of the chapters and you'd be so grateful you opened the book again to let him write himself into your world. Would you give him another shot? Would you give him a try? This is what he wants. He comes into this world to write himself into our stories with love and with faithfulness. This is our God. So Jesus, for coming into this world in really an unlikely way, who else would have thought of this except you? But tonight we sit here or stand here and we're grateful. Would you empower us and give us the capacity to grasp this? Would you, would you put the dots together? Would you help us make sense of this in Jesus where we've been afraid to or resistant to open our lives to you? and let you restore our relationship with a Father who loves us. If we would take a shot at that, you would be faithful to that. It's happened that way countless times on earth. And then for those of us, Jesus, you know our story, have tried or think we've tried, and given you a shot. And, well, it just didn't work out like we thought. Would you give us the courage to try again? to look your way again, to experience the wonder of that birth, that death, that resurrection, that promise to come back for us. It's no wonder, Jesus, they call you Emmanuel, for you truly are God with us. And we're so grateful for it, Jesus. Amen.